Now we can get to our text. We are back in the Gospel of John uh, together, so uh, you can uh, open up your Bibles to John chapter 16. Uh, We've been away from the Gospel of John for a little bit now. It feels like a lifetime ago to me, uh, but I'm very excited to be back there. A reminder of where we're up to in context. Jesus is giving the upper room discourse. He's aware that his time on earth is rapidly drawing to a close, that he is about to go to the cross. And so he's preparing his disciples for his departure. So this whole section is Jesus giving his final words to his followers of the things he thinks are most important for them to grasp. Think about it. If you're about to go away permanently, what is the message you might give to your children? What are you going to tell them? You know that in a week, you're gone for good. What are the things that you want them to cling to? Right? That's what Jesus, he's giving those, those final instructions, those things of deep importance that he wants his disciples to know. So what we've seen during this discourse is a balancing of encouragement, promises of the Spirit's presence, encouragement that God will be with them, and also challenges to be faithful in the midst of trial. So we've seen a balance of encouragement and a, a, and, a, and a challenging them to remain strong when times are tough. Most recently, at the end of chapter 15 and the start of 16, we saw a promise that as we hold to the teachings of Jesus, the world will reject us as it rejected Christ. As we proclaim the truth, the world will reject it as foolishness to those who are perishing. So that's what we've just seen at the end, a promise from Jesus of rejection, right? Like I said, there's an encouragement that he'll be with us, and there's a challenge to stand firm when the world rejects you. So that's what we've been seeing in this important teaching of Jesus. Largely on the balance It's quite a challenging passage to be ready for suffering, to be ready to know that when difficult times come upon you as a follower of Jesus, that's not because you are out of step with the will of God. Often it's because you are in step with the will of God. That is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Because you're walking in the light of Jesus And the scripture says the world has rejected the light because they love the darkness, right? So when you bring light to a dark place, it can upset the world. That brings us back to our passage for this week, which on our balance brings us back to being a bit more encouraging. So last week we had this challenge about rejection, and this week we're coming back to a more encouraging passage on the balance. So... If you have your Bible there, open up to John 16, 5 to 7. We're going to start with, we'll be going all the way through to 15, but we're going to start with John 16, 5 to 7. But now I am going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet, because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth, it is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counsellor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Amen. All right, we begin with a straight up controversy in this passage. Jesus says, I'm going away, and none of you ask me where I am going. Can anyone pick a problem with that at all? Anyone been tracking along this Gospel of John over the last few months? They have actually asked Jesus where he's going. Do you remember that in our passage? So Jesus says, none of you ask me where I'm going. In John 13, Peter says, Jesus, where are you going? In chapter 14, Thomas says, Jesus, where are you going? 
And now Jesus says, none of you ask me where I am going. Gee, that sounds a little bit difficult, doesn't it? I guess the Bible's flawed and we'll just write it off as irrelevant. I'm glad some of you laughed, thank you. No, that's not the answer. Um, We have a better explanation than that. There's a couple of different ways someone can ask you about where you're going, if you think about it. One of them goes like this. Where are you going? What is the purpose? How long are you going for? When will you return? What will you be doing while you're there? So on and so forth. Genuine interest, a genuine desire to understand why someone might be going. Think of someone walking away from a successful, well-paying job where they are loved, deciding to take a different job, which is riskier, less pay, the future uncertain. Think of the questions people might ask that person to try and understand. Why are you doing this? Why would you walk away from this to that? Deep questions, trying to get your head around what it is they're doing and what's motivating them, right? That's one way we can ask people where they're going. Then there's the other way of asking. Think of you've planned a family trip with young children to Dreamworld. It's been planned for a few weeks and the kids are just absolutely pumped. And then unfortunately, at the last minute, you have to cancel because of work. And your kids say, in their deep disappointment, but where are you going instead? And you begin to explain, but they're not actually listening. Because the reality is they don't care. The question of where you're going is not actually to understand where you're going. It's an expression of saying whatever, it else, whatever else is taking you away, whatever it else it is you're going to do, it should be less important than going to Dreamworld. Right? That's what that question means. Do you get what I'm saying? Where are you going? They don't actually care about the answer. The where are you going is purely designed so whatever it is you might say, you're meant to feel like it's less important than going to Dreamworld. Right? That's the other way of asking where are you going. It's not actually to understand, it's simply to express frustration that you have prioritized something else instead of what my heart's desire was, right? Anyone ever been there with their kids? I'm sure some of you have, right? That's what that question is. It expresses a heart's desire that you have prioritized something else other than what I thought it should be. That's what's going on. This is what the disciples have been saying to Jesus. They haven't been seeking the deeper things of God. They've not asked Jesus to explain why he must die on the cross, why he ever took on flesh in the first place, why he needs to return to the right hand of the Father. They are simply complaining that Jesus is going and they can't come or that Jesus is leaving them on their own, right? It's not a question to know. It's more of a complaint that Jesus is prioritizing something else other than being with them. Anyone feel like you might have felt similarly? By the way, I get it. Remember, Jesus has given them their purpose. They've walked away from jobs. They've walked away from family. They've walked away from homes. They've followed Jesus for three years. They've eaten meals with him. He's given them their very friends that they have because he called them all together. Jesus has been their purpose, their direction, their goal, their future. He's been everything. And then he says, and by the way, I'm leaving you now. And they're like, hang on, whatever it is you're leaving us for, that's wrong. You should stay with us. So that's been their expression. None of them have truly tried to understand what Jesus is actually doing. That is why Jesus can say, none of you have asked me where I'm going. No one's truly tried to understand. It's just been a reaction. Then Jesus says something interesting. It's for their benefit he is going away or the counsel of the Holy Spirit will not come. So why is that? Can Jesus and the Holy Spirit not work together? Is there some kind of beef between the two? So Jesus is like, we can't be in the same room together. Um, 
No, of course not. Why can't the Spirit come until Jesus returns? Well, the mission of Jesus is not complete until he sits at the right hand of the Father. You see, the mission of Christ was to come by the Father's will, to live a perfectly obedient life to the Father's will, to go and die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin, to pay the penalty of the Father's wrath that he holds against us. And then when Jesus rose, he showed that he had conquered sin and death, and then he rose in victory to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he lives to intercede for us forevermore, where he sits at the right hand of the Father as a permanent testament forevermore of the glory and grace of God who paid the penalty of your sin, right? The finished work of Christ is when he sits at the right hand of the Father, declaring for all time that the Son conquered and defeated sin and death. Amen? And Jesus says, now when I go and I sit, having defeated sin and death, and I sit at the right hand of the Father, then the Spirit will come. Right? When Jesus has finished, and he will send the Spirit. So the coming of the Spirit doesn't happen until Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, where Jesus intercedes for us forever more. Amen and amen. Our passage then moves on, John 16, 8 to 11, about the Spirit. When He comes, He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in Me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see Me. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, this is obviously a summary statement. It says a lot in a very compressed form. But this is what it's saying. The Spirit will convict the world about sin because they do not believe in Jesus. In other words, the world's ultimate sin is the rejection of Christ. That men love the darkness rather than the light. And the Spirit will come and bring conviction of sin that we rejected Jesus who is the Son of God. Just think about it for a moment. Think about Jesus' life on earth. He healed the broken. He welcomed the rejected. He forgave the unforgivable. He broke down divisions of gender, race, social standing. And we killed him. Why? Because he revealed to us our sin. Jesus said lust equals adultery, anger equals murder. Rather than accept our sin, we killed the one who revealed it. The one who would bring light upon our darkened souls. Get rid of the light rather than come out of the darkness. When we come to faith, we should all go through the agony of knowing it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. We need to go through the agony of knowing that Jesus died and suffered and bore the wrath of the Father because our sin put him there, the one who had to pay the penalty of it. Our rejection of the glory, our rejection of the Lordship of Christ is why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus suffered and died.
because you helped kill the perfect Son of God. This is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. He brings about our rejection of who Christ is and makes it known to us. The pain of the death of the Son of God. About sin and about righteousness because we will no longer see him. Now why that statement? What, what role of the Spirit is that? Well, this is to convict the world about false righteousness. About a belief in its own goodness. Its own morality. A righteousness that leaves us in our sin. As we said, Jesus revealed the works of man as dark. He revealed that our righteous deeds were evil. Now he's going to the Father and the Spirit, through Jesus' followers, will continue to reveal man's attempts at self-righteousness as useless and evil. Right? That's how the work will continue. It irritates people when we speak about being saved by grace and not by works. Have you ever had anyone get annoyed if they come up and tell you that, you know, thank you for your generosity or thank you for your hard, diligent work or thank you for any number of things about your character, about something good you're doing, and you respond with the gospel. You respond by saying, well, look, it's really because of the work of Jesus in me. It's Jesus who made me generous. It's Jesus who has done this work in me. And it irritates people. They don't like it. Oh, no, that, you know, whatever, blah, 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 don't give me that Jesus rubbish. They don't like Why? Because what they want to say is, you have done what you've done by your own effort. And they can acknowledge that. They can say, oh, Calvin, he's a good guy, and I can admire what he's done, and I can do that. And you say, no, you can't, because it's all about Jesus. And then to accept that means you have to accept his lordship. And they don't want to. It convicts the world when you point to Christ instead of yourself. And that's what the Spirit will do. The disciples of Jesus will keep to point, keep pointing at Christ, and it will keep convicting the world of self-righteousness because we're not into it. We're not about self-righteousness because we first had to acknowledge that we are sinful and we are only saved by grace, right? So the Spirit brings conviction of self-righteousness. Finally, judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. The vindication, the, the truth of Christ was his resurrection and ascension to the Father. In doing so, Jesus showed that he had defeated sin and death and that Satan is officially judged and brought to an end. The problem for this world is that it followed the ruler of this world and rejected the rule of Jesus. And the Spirit brings conviction of this stupidity. So the Spirit will bring conviction and at the same time, glory to Jesus, for the Spirit will convict of sin because of rejecting Jesus' death on the cross, convict of righteousness because of the holy life of Jesus, now seen in his followers, reveals the sin of self-righteousness, and convict of judgment because Jesus has been declared righteous and the devil condemned. Right? That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will keep pointing this world to the death and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And those appointed to life will believe. And then finally, the last part of our passage, John 16, 12 through to 15. John 16, 12 to 15. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. That is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. 
Church, this whole passage is great for us to understand like the whole of the Scripture is, but can I challenge you that you need to latch on to this last part of this passage. This is crucial for you to grasp this morning. If you get these few verses wrong, this is what leads to all kind of destructive heresies. Jesus is the truth, right? True? He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the final revelation of God. Hebrews builds in its understanding in the book of Hebrews to tell us that God has spoken by prophets, but now he has spoken by his Son. Right? The truth. In the beginning was the Word. He is the truth of God. So Jesus now says in this passage, I have more to tell you, but you can't handle it now. When the Spirit comes, he will guide you into the truth. What truth is the Spirit going to guide them into? And this is the crux of the issue that we have to wrestle with this morning. Is the Spirit going to come and guide them into all kinds of new and interesting truth that only the Spirit brings? If we think that, we end up in a lot of trouble. And this has happened throughout the ages of the church. We could end up with extra books considered authoritative. A new revelation of Jesus like the Mormons have. Right? They've got four extra books. A new revelation of the Spirit. New truth that we might need to know, which results in heresy. We could end up with a particular prophet or prophetess whose interpret interpretations create all kinds of legalism like the Seventh-day Adventists have. We could end up like Pentecostal churches, saying that the Spirit has given them all of this stuff which is extra to the Scriptures, teaching prosperity or, or teaching all kinds of things which are false, but being treated like God Himself has said them. If we think that the Spirit is here to give us new truth that only the Spirit can bring, then who knows where we might end up? Right? If I stand up to you next Sunday and say, oh, church, as your main teacher, the Spirit has spoken to me, and here's what he says to you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? No, don't do that. Just come and punch me. No, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, the point is no. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm here to do. It's not what any of our elders are here to do, and that is not what this passage says. The passage here helps us navigate and avoid these traps. The Spirit will guide them into truth, which means the Spirit enables us to understand the Word of God. All of these things which Jesus said his disciples couldn't understand, but the Spirit removes the veil over our eyes, and the Word of God comes alive. Some of you will be like me. I didn't become a Christian until I was an adult. And I remember a number of times in my life, uh, sitting in a motel room, bored, going through the drawers, finding a Gideon's Bible, picking it up and reading, and thinking it was the most nonsensical, boring rubbish I'd ever come across in my life. Honestly, that was my reaction. I'm like, who could ever spend time reading this? It doesn't make any sense to me. Back in the drawer. And then God saved me, and the Spirit opened my eyes, and I couldn't put his word down. The difference is the Spirit lifted the veil and illuminated the word of God. Right? That's what the Spirit does. He makes the truth of God's word come alive to us. Note what our passage says. The Spirit will not speak on his own. He speaks what he hears, says Jesus. He glorifies me because he takes what is mine and declares it to you. Then Jesus says, everything the Father has is mine, and then the Spirit declares whatever is mine. In other words, the Father declared to the will by his will to the Son, and the Son proclaimed, and now the Spirit brings to mind what Jesus has taught. In other words, the triune God is completely and utterly unified. 
What does that mean for you and me? It means beware anyone who declares anything to you which is not directly from the Word of God. Because the Word of God is God's will declared to the Son and then made alive by the Holy Spirit. Right? That is the Word of God. And anything you hear in a church must come from the Word of God. Willed by the Father, declared by the Son, illuminated by the Spirit. Church, I mean this dead serious. You are all way too trusting of us Bible teachers. I mean that with all my heart. You are way too trusting of us Bible teachers, in my opinion. Don't believe me. Don't believe someone because they have the title pastor. Don't believe someone because they're famous and they're on the radio or on YouTube. Is it the Word of God? Acts 17, 11 says, the people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Why were they more noble? Because they heard the teaching of the apostle Paul and checked it up against the Bible to see if it was true. It's true. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And they're noble because they checked up on Paul. How much more so me, right? Now, I'm not being used by God to write the New Testament. I don't have that special revelation of the Spirit working in me. Check up on me. Get into your word. Know what it says and hold everything I say against the word of God. And the same goes, like I said, because you're listening to Christian radio and you hear a preacher on there. Oh, it must be true. The preacher on the radio said it. Rubbish. Check it up against the Word of God. Be noble of character and test what you hear. So please, you know, go on holidays. Sit in a church somewhere. Check them up against the Word of God. Come here week in, week out. Check it up against the Word of God, right? Test what you hear against the Word of God. Please, please, don't trust people just because they have a title or because I regularly preach up here. If it's not from the Word of God, it's not worth hearing. I think a big issue for many people is we keep looking for special divine revelation in our lives, and if we study the Word of God and apply it every day to every decision, you'll find the Word of God is enough. Right? So Jesus finished his work of our redemption and he sits at the right hand of the Father and he sent the Spirit who comes to reveal the truth who is Jesus and he convicts the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. He reveals to us the truth of God's Word, which is contained wholly in your Bible and needs no addition. In closing, so can the Spirit speak to us today? Yes. But He will only speak what reveals the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ and his word. Anything outside of that, you need to be very skeptical of. Amen? Know your Bible. Know what it says. And test everything you hear against it. And the promise of this passage is, the Spirit will help you understand the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the great encouragement of your word. Lord, although the disciples at the time didn't understand, but you leaving was to sit in glory at the right hand of the Father, having defeated sin and death. The Lord, you have sent the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer. We thank you, Lord, that he brings conviction of sin. But Lord, he also reveals the truth. 
The same truth that was willed by the Father was declared by the Son and is now made alive to us by the Spirit. Lord, we thank you that the Spirit can guide us and and help us understand your word. And we simply pray for ourselves as a church, Lord, we would be diligent in knowing your word. Lord, that we would test what we hear. We would test what is spoken against the truth of the word of God. Lord, may it never be added to, may it never be altered, may it never be changed in any way, but may we stand on the full counsel of your word. We pray and ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.